Hey everybody, Dr. Sean here doing a video on my favorite exercise, why I think it is the single best exercise for humans to do. If you could only do one exercise, this is the exercise that you should do and that I know I certainly would do if I could do nothing else. So let's get right into it. In this video, I'm going to be talking about sprinting. And I'm going to get into why I think it's the best exercise, get into a little bit of the science, and then I'm going to cover tips on how to sprint because some of you are going to need some guidance. I know a lot of my clients and followers on social media have asked for that guidance. And while I kind of think that uh, uh, sprinting is a really natural thing, there are some really important points that I have learned over my 12 years of sprinting that I want to get into and share it with you. So first of all, uh, this one exercise, nothing else comes close to it. Nothing else has the return on the time and the effort that you put into it in terms of results and improving your body than sprinting. So let me just ask right at the outset, if you're listening to this video and watching it, name one other exercise that you could do that gets you more short of breath in 10 seconds than sprinting. Think about that. Any other activity you could engage in that gets you more short of breath in 10 seconds than sprinting. That's it. I've thought about everything else. I don't know everything else. If you know something else, I'd like to hear from you. So what happens when you sprint is you use virtually every single muscle in your body when you're sprinting. That's why sprinters have an amazing body development. They have amazing musculature, the amazing frame. They just have this natural development to their muscles. One of my uh, followers or one of my clients, I should say, actually, he never lifted and he just was jacked just from, from sprinting. It has that much of a benefit in, in terms of improving your body. So uh, let me ask you, uh, a, a share with you another insight and ask you another question. And that question is, um, have you ever seen a skinny marathoner? Somebody who does distance running. Of, of course you've seen distance runners and marathoners and they're skinny very often, particularly the longer they do distance running, the more thin they are. Now let me ask you another follow on question. Have you ever once seen a dedicated sprinter who is pudgy, overweight, or obese? Of course you have. Because if you are a dedicated sprinter, you are going to optimize your muscle and your fat. There's a lot of people out there that are dedicated distance runners, have been running for years, and they're still overweight. So what is the difference about sprinting and distance running that allows you to maximize your muscle to fat ratios? Well, it turns out it's because of one molecule called a myokine. M-Y-O-K-I-N-E-S, myokines or myokine, M-Y-O-K-I-N-E. So I'd like you to Google it, read about it, and what it is, it's a messaging molecule, super cool, that goes around your body and it signals to tissue in your body. The myokines are released chiefly from big, large muscles in your legs, in your lower extremity. And they signal to the rest of your body to build muscle and burn fat. So if you are, that's why if you lift weights, you never want to cut or uh, eliminate your leg days because they create these myokines and they actually will build your muscles in your arm even if you're not using your arms. It just starts, it goes out and trans, transfers these signals to the rest of your body to build tissue and cut fat. So it's, it's a great thing. And of course, when you sprint, you're, you're, you're using a lot of your lower extremities muscles that release these myokines. So it's really important. Let me take you back to high school. When I was in high school, I was not a, uh, much of an athlete, but I did do cross country for a couple seasons and I did winter track. And during that time, I ran cross country and winter track. I ran distance running too. And there were a couple, you know, couple groups of guys on the, the, uh, the, the groups of people on the team. One were the distance runners and one were the sprinters. 
And what's interesting to me is I recollect, I remember very vividly that those of us who were uh, distance runners, we, we kind of, we, we walked around, we were kind of lanky, and we looked like, if you remember the character from uh, the Wizard of Oz movie, the Scarecrow, you know, kind of uncoordinated and floppy and everything. That's kind of how the, the distance runner was, or similar to the character, maybe Napoleon Dynamite, if you know who that is, or Sheldon off the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so kind of thin and emaciated and not, not too, too coordinated. But the sprinters, they had this smooth saunter. They were very smooth. And if you notice, people that are also really fast running backs, they have a saunter. They're coordinated and they just have the smoothness about them and nice physiques. So very different builds, very different sports, very different forms of exercise between distance running and uh, sprinting. So when it comes to these mild kinds, you really want more of those to optimize your frame. So if you or somebody out there doing distance running, you're, you're not getting those myokines released as much as when you do sprinting. So you should transition, I encourage all my clients to stop doing distance running and actually transition to sprinting. Because you can go across uh, the country and, get, and go into gyms and see all kinds of people running on treadmills, jogging, trying to lose weight. And they're just not maximizing their ability to lose um, to, to lose that fat and to gain muscle. Let me share with you a really cool insight on some MRIs, okay? These are MRIs and the white stuff in the middle is visceral fat. That's the belly button, that little black thing on the top and back, the black things are muscles in the back. So this is a guy who was filled with visceral fat. He came back for a scan. And in two months, <clears throat> he was doing 10 miles a day, five times a week, so running 50 miles. And in less than two months, he completely eliminated his visceral fat and got a six pack. Look at that. Got jacked, built muscles. So what did he do? He didn't change his diet. He only did one thing in between these two frames. He simply stopped doing distance running and he became a sprinter. He, 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 he adopted sprinting. So this is a perfect example of how these myokines uh, release when they're released go through your body in short order and tell you to shred to get shredded It tells you to build muscle and get rid of visceral fat. So radiographically it became my most favorite exercise when as a researcher studying the optimization health and um, The elimination of chronic disease. So I have all my clients now uh, sprinting. So it's really important insight I wanted to be able to share with you that, that uh, we've seen that time and time again that that's what happens inside the body and happens outside the body too. You'll see a shredded look when people start uh, sprinting. So it's a really important thing to, to do. So the other insight I want to share with you, another, another Dr. Sean insight, is uh, faces. So if you follow me for a long time, you know I'm big on faces uh, and then I like to post on facial changes as you get rid of visceral fat, your face becomes more lean and less inflamed. The opposite is also true. When you put on visceral fat, when you eat a lot of processed foods, your face becomes inflamed. And we wear the, our health on our face. Our faces and our bodies tell the story of how healthy we are consistently between the face and the, and the, and the, the rest of the body. So what's interesting to me is I pay attention to these faces a lot. And I notice in runners, when they're out there jogging and they've been running for quite a while, They've got a really uh, inflamed looking face. I mean, more inflamed looking than normal. They typically, when, I, when I'm driving my car and I go by and I take a look at their faces, they're like this. <sighs> I mean, they look, they look awful. I mean, the looks on their faces. I challenge you, look at somebody who's been out running for a long time and then look at their face and honestly ask yourself this one question. Does that look like it's a, they're having fun? Does it, you know, I know you don't go out to run to have fun, but do, does it look like that's a good activity that you want to do? No, I, I just, it, it's an extraordinarily uh, uh, troubling look to me. Now, when I see a sprinter, very different look on their face. Now, of course, they're not out there doing it for a super long time, a short sprint, but they've got this intense face on them. They've got this game face on, and it has this interesting effect. While the runner, you know, flame look on that face, you know, like they're all, you know, haggard and stuff, that kind of repulses me, makes me 
less interested in running. The sprinter space makes me want to find some place to go and sprint. The other interesting thing is just the form of a sprinter. In full sprint is a, is a very attractive form and when you see it done well, it makes you want to go out and sprint. So sprinting has a lot of attractiveness about it on a biological basis. And I think the reason is because it really optimizes. In fact, no other sport or no other exercise or activity I can think of throughout humanity has had a more important and significant role in keeping humans in the gene pool and optimizing their health and optimizing their quality of life than sprinting because it protected you to be able to get away from threats and it also allowed you to catch animals when you would hunt so that you could be a better provider and, and be able to hunt and gather better. So sprinting is significant, it's very, very important uh, activity throughout a human existence. And we've gotten away from it. Everybody's got this, there's this love affair now with everybody out doing distance running. And I wanna ask you a question. You know, uh, we, I gave you the example of how runners are always thin. Well, that's the end state of a distance runner is they become um, atrophied, very thin. I, I don't get what the love affair is with shrinking your musculature. Now, I am never gonna be a bodybuilder. It's not because I couldn't, well, I mean, I, I suppose I could work on becoming a body, but you, the hypertrophy body uh, you know, of a, of a bodybuilder is not the look, not the state that I, I shoot for. Neither is an anorexic, really thin body, and, and nor is an obese body. I wanna get a felt, very fit, very um, uh, healthy looking body that functions well, performs well, like, like a hunter-gatherer has that kind of a look. Uh, and if you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, they're, they're not big bodied muscular types and they're not thin emaciated uh, skinny types either. So it's right in the middle. The track bill, you know, Usain Bolt, you know, the look of, a, of a, an accomplished sprinter is what I wanna get. So these distance runners end up losing their muscle. And this brings up a huge problem in our country. Uh, this, a scourge uh, that's afflicting humanity right now, you know, a form of chronic disease, and that I like to talk about this to bring awareness to it, is, and it's called sarcopenia, so muscle atrophy. So your muscles literally atrophy and shrink and go away as you age, and actually, it's not so much you become older, it's because you're accumulating more chronic disease. The processes that cause chronic disease cause sarcopenia, which is a chronic disease. And I think uh, the origin, and it's, it's certainly contributing to it, worsening all forms of chronic disease that I ever studied, is visceral fat. So visceral fat plays a huge role in sarcopenia. You want to eliminate that visceral fat. But you don't want to contribute to it also by doing a lot of distance running. So think about high distance runners, marathoners, very thin and, 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 and atrophied looking. And, um, and, and so to our bicyclists, people, you know, any kind of long distance kind of sport, high duration sport they get. So these cyclists are really skinny and thin too. Listen, when you are 90 years old or maybe 70 years old and you, you are emaciated and thin and, and frail, you know, on, we're on your way, it's your muscles and your functionality that's gonna allow you to get your butt out of a chair so you can, you can do those things to lift and enjoy a quality of life. So do not contribute to sarcopenia by doing a lot of durational exercise. I challenged my clients, showed you the MRI. Other people are starting to catch on for the first time. I've, I've seen another personality on, on social media, Carnivore MD 2.0, Dr. Paul Saladino. He's now advocating against distance running and doing sprinting. So um, I think that's awesome. I challenge other doctors, other health coaches out there, other personal trainers, get on board understanding uh, sprinting and see if it doesn't improve your clients better. I don't get this, this distance running and, 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 and contribute to it because you you're building, there's only two types of muscles, fast twitch and slow twitch. So when you do distance running, you're destroying your fast twitch. I mean, you're not, you're, you're actually, um, not building fast twitch, you're building uh, the slow twitch and it diminishes it. So you, you get to choose one or the other. So I choose to build my fast twitch muscles because 
when you look at quality of life in the end I don't really care that I can run forever what I care is I, I have a more functional lifestyle and and I'm and I can breathe and I can get my butt out of a chair and I can climb a tree or or get myself through a window whatever I have to do um, rather than be able to run run forever so quality of life really pertains more to sprinting I think you get a better return all right so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, my first time sprinting okay so many of you have never sprinted in a very very long time so the first time I thought about challenging myself as an adult to sprint it was at the age of 48 and uh, well, it was about it was actually about 46 so when I was first thinking about sprinting I remember thinking my god it has been decades decades like 20 years 30 years since I've sprinted a long long time and I thought, uh, what is it going to be like? I, I mean, it was very, very intimidating. It caused a lot of apprehension. And so when I went out to try it, I lived out in a very rural area. I had, you know, these, it was out in the country and we had like 10 acre lots in, in, in these homes. And, uh, but, you know, I had neighbors. So I, I remember I looked around. I did a 360, literally, around my backyard to make sure that none of my neighbors were outside and could see me sprint because. I, I was so concerned that I was going to do something wrong, like trip <laughs> and do a face plant, and it, I'd never hear the end of it. So um, that, that was my own experience. But what happened was that I started slow and I accelerated to, to maximum speed. So I was sprinting and I held it for, for a few seconds. And I'm like, oh my God, I am sprinting. I did it. I can sprint. I was an older guy and I could sprint. So you can too. You have the ability. Everybody probably listening to this video sprinted at some point in their childhood when they were younger. I uh, got foot races and stuff. So you have the innate ability to sprint. You may not be able to sprint well, but you have sprinted in the past and sort of like riding a bike. If you did it one time, you can do it again. You may not be great at it, but you know I'm going to give you some tips on how to get started on it. And the key to this is starting slow and build, build into it. So um, uh, one point I, I want to share with you, if you think you're really bad at sprinting, like you, you're really slow and you're just out of shape, let me encourage you. You're going to have the best results. You listening right now, if that is you, you're going to improve the most versus somebody who's maybe a collegiate athlete and they just want to get back into sprinting. Maybe they just do volleyball or something. But the older person that is really in bad shape and really slow and hasn't sprinted in 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to improve the most and it's going to be the most important for you to uh, slowly implement a sprinting program because you're going to have a much better return. So this sprinting, this 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 activity, this form of exercise is way more important than you can even imagine. So just get started and you see these benefits over a period of time. All right, let's talk some tips, okay? I said I was gonna tell you how to do it. So key to this uh, is to start slow and slowly advance your sprinting, okay? And even before you start anything, you gotta warm up, okay? Uh, we're not like animals that are free of chronic disease. And why are animals free of chronic? Because they eat what they should eat. They don't eat what they shouldn't eat. And they exercise in a very intense manner. They don't go out to the gym and hang out there for an hour and a half or, you know, long distance running or, you know, uh, circuit training for, you know, 45 minutes. It's a high intensity event and then it's, and it's done very, very briefly. So, and they do a lot of sprinting because they got to get away from predators or if they're a predator, they got to catch a prey. So there's a lot of high intensity sprinting. So um, first warm up. So what I like to do is just walk. You know, I walk somewhere where I'm going to be sprinting. Um, you know, I live here in Minnesota, Minnesota, so I sprint in an indoor track for, for a good portion of the year because there's <laughs> ice and snow everywhere and I do not want to slip and hurt myself. Key to this uh, exercise when you're particularly older is no injuries. You don't want to get injured anytime even if you're a young athlete. If you're young, it's less devastating. But if you are old and you get an injury, it's going to be a very long time to or much longer than for an average person because chronic disease, uh, visceral fat. Get rid of that visceral fat, you'll heal much faster. So 
I talk a lot about visceral fat. Get, find out about it and, and get rid of it so that you can optimize your health. So warm up, start slow, do some walking, maybe do a little bit of light jogging just to get your joints going. And once you, you're warmed up a little bit for a few minutes, some people will take a little bit longer to do that. And then you're ready to get started. Now, I also recommend some stretching, okay? So um, lots of different stretches. I'm gonna go into all stretches other than one that I really like to do and it's a full deep squat, okay? So I'm gonna back up. Most people when they squat, I'll back up here. When they squat, they squat with their, hopefully you can see my heels. Heels are up in the air. You know, this is kind of how they squat. Uh, I can't even do that one anymore. It's interesting <laughs> how hard that is for me. Um, but the way I squat, what I recommend is keep your heels flat on the ground, okay? So I go down and I bring my heel, keep my heels flat on the ground. And then I bring my, I like to bring my legs up. Now you're not gonna be able to do this if you haven't done it, you have to work on that, okay? So you'll probably only be able to go down a little, a little bit, but gradually work on this hold until you get lower and you're gonna bring your butt down, okay? Bring your butt to your, your Achilles and you, it decompresses your back, it stretches out your back and it's great for your hips, it's great for your knees, great for all your joints. So it really is a fantastic, a fantastic exercise. And I bring my legs up and I sometimes I rock just a little bit and the, I, that's all I have to do. I don't have to do anything else other than get myself into a squatting position, squat a little bit and I'm ready to sprint. Other people will have to do a little more stretching, do a little more exercise. So again, start, start slow and advance slowly. You cannot take off like an animal, like a deer. A deer can take off, it's down grazing and suddenly a wolf shows up and it's bolting from zero to 30, 40 miles per hour and nothing flat uh, because it doesn't have chronic disease and it won't tear in something. If we do that at our age with chronic disease and guess what, visceral fat, you're gonna have a tendon tear, uh, ligament uh, strain, muscle strain, uh, you're just going to damage something. So you, you've you got to start slowly and work your way up. So I recommend starting in a standing position and just slowly accelerate. Uh, it might take you 10 seconds to slowly accelerate to maybe 30 seconds to over a slow period of time to the fastest you can possibly run. And once you've achieved that and you are maximum effort on that sprint, you hold that anywhere from two more seconds to maybe as long as 20 seconds. So you hold that maximum effort and then you slowly taper off, okay? Don't hit the brakes, just slow down and, and walk and that you just did your first sprint. So a minimum is hold it for two seconds and you, know, you, can, do, you can do 30 seconds, but at some point it stops being a sprint, it's, it's a fast run because you, you know, basically your sweet spot, I tell people, is 10 seconds. So glycogen expenditure. Max effort, sprinting, 10 seconds. Usain Bolt has blown through his glycogen at that point. And um, thereafter, it's an anaerobic uh, metabolism. So you get to uh, blow through your, your glycogen and, you know, depending on how long you, you take to get to that, you know, 10, you know, uh, five to 20 seconds, depending on what you got. And, uh, and then you, um, uh, you can slow down. So I basically recommend try to, on average, about a 10 second sprint, maybe as short as two seconds, maybe as long as 20 seconds. And I also recommend variety, okay? So nature is not big on numbers. Nature doesn't really care about 10 seconds. So what nature would do is different circumstances. We'd introduce variability in our lifestyle. So sometimes we'd go a week without having to sprint. Other times we'd have to sprint every, a few times a day. And maybe it's a short sprint, maybe it's a long sprint. But you want variability, okay? So your muscles get a, a, and your body get challenged with variable circumstances. So break, you know, make sure you, you, you don't have any kind of monotonous plan. You know, people want, you know, they, they're very interested in how many sprints and how long and, and numbers and stuff like that. Mix it up, mix it up. And so I gave you a few numbers, two to about 20 seconds, maybe 30, 30 once in a while, maybe uh, once in a blue moon, I'll do a 60 second, but not very often. So 
uh, keep it keep it generally short and as far as frequency goes eh, I try you know roughly have my clients do six to ten sprints uh, or so every other day so six to ten sprints over every other day now how long in between those those sprints um, about uh, 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 you know I, I use sometimes I go back to back other times uh, I will wait as long as an hour so one of my favorite days uh, I do some teleworking uh, some of my favorite days are I sprint and then I wait an hour you know go back in my office stand up desk do some work go back do another sprint wait an hour do some more work so mixing it up that way so that's that's a, that's a great thing to do otherwise sometimes I'll wait you know t anywhere two minutes maybe five minutes you know mix it up and and change it around all right a few other tips I want to share with you is um, I mentioned don't run on ice don't risk an injury um, you can try to find a gym you know the YMCA have a lot of YMCA's and uh, other gyms will have these indoor tracks and you should you should go use an indoor track so you have access to to that but another key trip I have to do some travel uh, and um, lots of lots of people have travel so when I travel to a hotel I like to go to the uh, um, the convention areas where I have those conference those big banquet hallways big banquet rooms I'll sprint either in one of those big banquet rooms or in the long hallways you know where they have these big hallways uh, people go out and mingle with cocktails and stuff out there uh, well you go out there when there's nobody around you can sprint up there and I used to go and ask permission it was kind of awkward and it was kind of weird I don't ask permission anymore I just go to these hotels um, I like Marriott I go to, I go to these hotels and I, I sprint in those those areas I never I just find out where they are and I go sprinting it doesn't take long right so by the time the security guy sees me in the camera and says you know, you know go check on a guy up there gray hair he's up there sprinting uh, I'm gone I'm done with my sprinting so uh, I've never had anybody say anything to me and uh, and then after doing a few times I, I go back and maybe do it longer and pretty pretty soon they just know who I am and I'm just a sprinter and I you know I don't do anything I, and I go on my way so you could you can consider doing that um, some people um, sprint um, going up steps um, I do not recommend ever sprinting up steps it's an unnatural uh, 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 device stairs There's nothing like it in ever in, in humanity for the past probably four four million years or so so avoid those stairs do not sprint I know you know people sprint up for in stadium runs and stuff athletic teams if you're a young person you could probably get away with it if you get an injury and recover but if you're an older person we're talking potentially a devastating injury it's just not worth it if you're a coach you're a high school coach you're a college coach I don't think you should be out there having your your players running that get, get them on a hill have them you, much safer, less chance for an injury. Uh, it'd be an interesting study to see how many people get injured doing those sprints up those stadiums. But for sure, if you're older, do not do it. Now, it's a cool thing and a great thing to sprint up a hill. The reason is you can't run as fast. So the biomechanics are not as challenging. So it's actually safer. So it is harder, you know, in terms of, you know, gravity's working it. Your ROI will be better, but it's not going to be as complicated the corollary the opposite of it is that if you sprint downhill way more challenging much more complicated the biomechanics are a lot more demanding and a higher incidence of injury sprinting down a hill so don't do that um, i don't even recommend a young person uh, if you really had to to get away from a threat then yeah um, but if you uh, don't have to sprint downhill don't do that sprint on level ground do not sprint on a treadmill Lots of people think, you know, can I sprint on a treadmill? And I see people doing it. And it's, I, you know, it's kind of cool to see the young kids, um, children, and, and young adults are able to do sprint really fast. Well, you know, they, if they get an injury, injury on that treadmill, they'll, they'll be able to recover. But for those of us, the biomechanics as you get older become more challenged. And you risk getting a serious injury because that surface that treadmill is not stationary ground that you're running on it's a moving surface so it's a different sort of activity and one little miscalculation and you could have you could suffer real significant injury so I do not recommend um, running on treadmills now shoes what kind of shoes should you wear I'm into nature so I recommend minimalist shoes no cushion zero drop 
What's a zero drop shoe is not uh, where the, the, the toe part and the heel part are the same level, they're flat. So most runner shoes unfortunately have heels and um, they have cushion in them and they're doing he heel strikes. You don't, when you sprint, you're gonna land on, on the balls of your feet and, 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 and kiss the ground, just kind of skim off of that and not heel strike. So uh, my favorite shoe, <laughs> I, li I, like, I like five finger Vibrams and Minimus shoes. My favorite shoes of all times are the, the ones I got here. Look at this. These are moccasins. But they are, the, the, there's no cushion in there. That's just a layer of leather, okay? So when I sprint, um, it, it feels cool to sprint um, barefooted, but even Native Americans, they have some kind of protection on their shoes, and moccasins are a great thing. You can feel the ground way better. If you have to try to read the ground and feel the ground through all that cushion, you're not going to be able to just perceive and discern the ground and make these little micro adjustments when you're sprinting um, as well when you got all that thick cushion. So, you know, you can get these things off Amazon, Minot Minotaka, Min Minotaka moccasins. I think they're like 50 bucks. They come with inserts. I rip those things out. <laughs> I just go nature because Native Americans didn't put any inserts in. You don't need any cushion, just a little bit of uh, uh, extra skin to protect your skin so you don't get cut on a rock or or a stick or something like that. All right, so I think uh, those are the important things that, that I covered. I don't think I've, I missed anything. I hope I've turned you on into sprinting, why it is the very best exercise you could do, it gives you your best return. And uh, the last thing I, I should tell you about is BFR bands. I'm not gonna go into them because I just did a video on them. But whenever you sprint, I recommend you wear BFR bands ones on your arms and ones on your legs because it will make it more challenging, more difficult to sprint, uh, but it will give you a better return. So in studies, the sprinters in Division I NCAA teams who wore them, they built more muscle and were running faster in six weeks compared to another group that did the exact same workout uh, but didn't wear these uh, BFR blood flow restriction bands. So it basically restricts your blood and I want you to pay, uh, listen to my YouTube video um, on BFR bands because I figured out something very interesting um, uh, that uh, I'll just bait it and leave it at that. How BFR bands make your lungs and the heart, your heart, stronger and better. So uh, that's going to benefit all your activities. So uh, take a look at that, uh, that YouTube video. And uh, if you like this uh, video, give it a like. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you like it. You can consider uh, subscribing to my channel uh, if, you, if you like this content and share it with other people so that they have the benefit of uh, learning about sprinting. And uh, if you wanna follow me on Twitter and Instagram, you can follow me uh, on those, those two social media platforms at uh, ampers, ampersand sign, D-R-S-E-A-N O M A R A at Dr. Sean O'Mara at D R S E A N O M A R A on Twitter and uh, Instagram, and uh, you've probably seen this video on uh, YouTube. So you can just uh, continue to follow me. Hopefully, subscribe to uh, hit the little alarm button. That way, you when I put these uh, videos out, I'm going to try to do more and more. Uh, you'll have this uh, content. So um, I'm a non. Um, profit uh, physician. Uh, I, I don't like profit when it comes to healthcare, and uh, I put content out to uh, improve the health of people. Uh, I've changed myself to becoming a specialist in health and performance optimization, so I use uh, internal biomarkers and external biomarkers that you can follow completely free to optimize your health instead of using laboratory studies and more expensive modalities. I tell you what you got to do, what you got to follow to optimize your health. So for your health, not my profit, Dr. Sean out.